All right, greetings. You know, I did my intro on the uh, recording for the archive with the microphone off, <clears throat> and somehow, I think I heard a beep. Some of you may have been telling me, hey, your mic's not on, maybe. I'm going to try to get, uh, if you bear with me for a moment, since we're live on a live stream for the Passover Memorial Service 2018, on the live stream on Facebook Live Sabbath service page. Um, and if it's not sunset yet where you where you are, that may be okay because we're going to go through a few minutes of room setup to make sure you've got your room set up the way it should be. And I will not be, we won't be hurrying you tonight like we, I've been told we did in the past. Hey, you kind of, to get that in in one hour, you rushed us. So we're going to take about 90 minutes with this tonight, total time with Mr. Armstrong, God's end time apostle Herbert Armstrong, speaking from recording during excerpts from his last Passover that he conducted in Pasadena at headquarters before he died, the last one he conducted there, in, which was in 1981. And uh, we'll... We'll, he'll cover all of his parts, and we'll take it nice and easy tonight with a solemn service so you won't feel rushed. And I've delayed it because I went through 80 different time zones, and though that may have made some of you wait a little longer after sunset than you might have wanted to, as long as we're after sunset so that it's on the 14th, and at a reasonable hour, not, you know, too close to midnight, except for some places where this will be airing, like Alaska, Hawaii, some of your, sun especially Alaska, some of your sunsets are not until 9.15 p.m., your local time. So that does run you pretty late. And on those Aleutian Islands, I'll be up like 1 o'clock in the morning running that one for you, brethren, on those Aleutian Island, Alaska Islands. I plan to be up a while tonight, and that's okay. And we'll run basically same service, live introduction, and excerpts from Mr. Armstrong's last Passover that he conducted from Pasadena before he died. Now, I see, hey, Patrick, greetings out there. Thank you. And uh, John, I hope to hear from you that... Uh, that one minute ago followed your page Sabbath service. I hope to hear from you that <clears throat> you are uh, getting the live stream okay. John, uh, as I reported during the service for last Sabbath, uh, John, I hope you don't mind I mention your last name. I think you probably want, won't. I want to ask for a prayer for you anyway. John is doing somewhat better than yesterday when he went to Walmart to pick up a... Uh, a, uh, a smartphone, which we're calling it like a mini Wi-Fi tablet because he's going to use it just like I use one. I use this to monitor our live streams and make sure we're on the air okay, as well as the green light from our encoder unit that tells me Facebook is reporting back we're, we're streaming okay. Uh, but John had a problem with his computer where he could not view the live video streams anymore, including recordings from the archive. And because Facebook, uh, Walmart had, I hate to do an advertisement here, but one of the places that sells cell phones had these on sale at a reasonable price, and we're able, we were able to uh, have it sent to the local store in Russellville, Arkansas, where John Byron lives. And uh, he checked it out yesterday, has his grandson set it up for him. And, John, if I can hear from you, uh, just a word that I see you followed us two minutes ago. But if I could just get a word on the comments that you're getting the signal, that will give me a little peace of mind and confidence because um, John's in a remote area, no brethren around him. He's been having some breathing difficulties. He's been anointed for that. And after a fervent prayer for him yesterday, he seems to be somewhat relieved from that my dad had a breathing difficulty uh, and 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 that can be very difficult well breathing difficult it can be very trying on you uh, John had to stop 
and rest for about 10 minutes, couldn't drive home from where he picked up the cell phone because the breathing wasn't safe for him to drive. He just had to stop for about 10 minutes. So, uh, John, I hope we hear from you. And uh, again, I checked that, you know, uh, brethren, if you're tuned in and it's not sunset yet where you are, Hang in there for a little bit because we're going to go through how to be sure your room is all set up so that you don't get in the middle of this and find out you don't have something you need. Uh, we'll take a few minutes, and it's purposely to delay so that those who are tuned in with us can relax. If you've got your room set up and you know you've got everything, you might just flip to John 13 or 14, 15, 16, 17, anywhere through John 13 through 17, and just be reading that quietly, privately to yourself in preparation for verses of Scripture from those chapters that God's end time apostle Herbert Armstrong will be covering as we play the excerpts from the recording of his last Passover that he conducted in Pasadena at headquarters in Pasadena before he died so uh, uh, you can even be doing that now anytime that we're just um, lulling or waiting until sun goes down where everybody is uh, it's okay for you to be with us at this moment if the sun's not down where you are but when the service actually starts that's when it gets critical. If the sun's not down at the time the service starts, just wait until the next uh, session, and we'll be repeating this again tonight with a live intro and excerpts from Mr. Armstrong. And my next one will probably make the live intro not as long because um, it'll be more likely to be sunset in the later time zones during the next session. Brother, does that make sense? And, you know, while we're scattered and we're not all able to be in one place, and there are a number of you I know, like John Bryan, who has no brethren near him where he, that he knows of, and this method of the Internet that God has opened up like a new open door. You know, the Internet and webcasting did not exist while Mr. Armstrong was alive, and yet, brethren, to me it seems God opened up this door along with the preservation of Mr. Armstrong's speaking in radio broadcast, uh, telecast, recordings of um, Bible study and sermons and other speaking occasions that uh, God's end time apostle did that were recorded and they are now preserved. Uh, why and then the internet opens up <clears throat> and recordings of those speaking occasions of Mr. Armstrong uh, can be found with an internet search on Bing, Google, all your various internet search engines, and up come all kind of hits finding things both spoken and written by God's end time apostle. You can hear him direct. No, no need for a lot of uh, hearsay. <laughs> you can get it as Mr. Armstrong would put it from time to time, as he would encourage us in ambassador and spokesman's clubs to get the facts by getting it straight from the horse's mouth. And, I, I, and when you get to the ultimate source, that means from God's Word. And the God's Word is Jesus Christ, the Logos, the spokesman, in written form. Mr. Armstrong reminded us many times, I think he'll even say that in this Passover tonight, he, with God's Spirit, opening his mind as the servant and as the leader, paralleling Moses, as if it were, uh, to give us the truth. He opened Mr. Armstrong's mind to it, and we're given that through him. And a reminder of Revelation 3, verse 3, we should, and one reason we're playing excerpts from Mr. Armstrong's recordings is because it tells us to remember by and through whom you received and heard God's truth. I'm quoting from Revelation 3, verse 3, and in principle, even though that's addressed to, um, let's see, Revelation 3, verse 3, that's addressed to the era just before, it begins in verse 8 with the Philadelphia era, that's addressed to, that would be Sardis, 
But in principle, that applies to all of us. Remember how you received and heard. And yes, there were works before Mr. Armstrong, but those works in that era before Mr. Armstrong rejected the uh, truth that God gave through Mr. Armstrong as he worked with that previous era. And that's the truth of these annual holy days. Uh, let me rephrase that. Of these annual feast days, because the Passover, it's one of seven feasts referenced in Leviticus 23, but the Passover is not an annual holy day. A holy day is defined as one, a day that, is sanctified, set apart, upon which no servile work can be done, and upon which we are to assemble. Passover, you can do it in your home. It's a feast day, not a holy day. During the daylight hours tomorrow, you, if, you, if you're at a work situation where your boss needs you and has scheduled you and requires you to be there tomorrow, you can work tomorrow. Hopefully, he'll let you off a little bit early so you can prepare for the Sabbath, uh, which beginning at sunset tomorrow night, is in essence a certain kind of double Sabbath in that it's a regular weekly Sabbath beginning Friday night sunset and an annual Sabbath at the same time as it is a weekly Sabbath, which supersedes it. The annual sab Sabbath supersedes the regular weekly Sabbath, but it's both. It's a double Sabbath. It's an annual Sabbath tomorrow night, the first day of unleavened bread, and tomorrow night is the night we'll be celebrating, the night to be much observed. And then, <clears throat> um, <clears throat> after a good night's sleep, after a night to be much observed, hopefully with brethren uh, in small fellowships, uh, ideally at one of your homes. If that doesn't work, though, uh, like Aaron Dean picked me up one time and a few other <clears throat> uh, brethren, and we all went to a restaurant and had a private room reserved for us that Aaron and his wife had arranged, Michelle, and um, we had a wonderful evening of fellowship together. And um, so that'll be tomorrow night, <clears throat> and uh, you know, and oftentimes during that evening, brethren, you share stories about how you came into the church, how God called you into the body of Jesus Christ. That's a good time to share that. That's a good question to throw out it on the table. And then let each person, you know, maybe the, if you're at someone's home, the, the head of that home could lead off with a question like, hey, let's go around the table and each of you take six minutes, ten minutes, whatever, and um, <clears throat> tell how God called you and how he brought you into the body of Jesus Christ. And <clears throat> those, those sometimes you find, wow, that's how God called you? And, and sometimes it's the same way with another person is the way he called you and often t and it could be different and it is you know there you'll hear different things and it's that's kind of wonderful and exciting so um, <clears throat> hope to be able to do some of that tomorrow night but brethren now let's uh, let me tell you again what we're going to do and I was I'm just kind of easing into the to this first session tonight because I didn't set up an exact time for people to be tuning in. I did put word out there that, hey, we'll be here and we'll be starting in about 10 minutes. I put that out about 8, 10 minutes, 8, 10, 12 minutes before we started, depending on where you may have seen that note. I put it on a few places and sent a few a few of you a private message that, uh, uh, that I wanted to be sure, John, and a few of you that uh, are having a new situation you know, he'd be watching on a on a phone, but he tested it yesterday, and I think he said it worked pretty well. Now, let me check again. Let me see. Uh, this is kind of new for me, John, so I'm just figuring out this one. I used to use a Windows phone to monitor, to monitor uh, what we were doing, and um, I'm using this one as an Android type of phone, an Andy Android type. And um, Patrick, I see you out there. Greetings to you and uh, Linda. And, uh, okay, John, let's see if I can send a note to you and ask you or if you're getting this. And then I'm going to roll um, something from my trailer on how to set up, how to make sure you've got the evening set up. And by then we'll start the service. And uh, hopefully those of you in several time zones, it'll be after sunset where you are. Again, if it's not, 
don't stay with us for the service. Wait till the next session if the sun is still up in the time zone where you are. I know that <clears throat> puts a requirement for a little bit of extra patience on some of you that may be sitting here saying, hey, my room's all set up. I'm ready and raring to go. Now, on a couple of places, on YouTube, on Vimeo, on our own website, cogtv.org and sabbath.tv, I have recordings from previous years uh, of the six or seven sessions that we go through during <clears throat> this Passover night with Mr. Armstrong conducting it, and it, some of them pause. Uh, we have one on our website that pauses after each section. When you go do the foot washing, it pauses, then you go through, uh, and some of them we have countdowns like we'll do tonight. And I'll explain that. That should work. We've got it timed so that even if you have an odd number of one, two, three, you can make that work for you. <clears throat> for you. And I'll explain that when we do the setup here in a moment. Um, <clears throat> if you've got an even number, everybody just goes one, two, one, two. You know, you set up in groups of two, and one washes two, and then change the water, and two washes one. Real simple. And two, each. Uh, a basin for each two of you and you would all work at the same time in groups of two and it's just one washing two and then change the water and two washing one and it goes decently orderly um, in quickness of time and and the foot washing part of the service is done if you have an odd number any odd number whether it be 11 or 111 or 99 just any odd number you take the last three people and they form a group everybody else in the even number up to the last three just pairs up in groups of two and one washes two two and then two washes one but that last group I'll just tell you this and I'll tell you this again later in the last group of three people it's not one washes two and two washes one it's going to be like this it's going to be one washes two then two washes number three and number three then washes number one. And over the years, that's worked out just fine. You only have one group of three. And any, no matter how large or small your grouping is, uh, whenever you've got an odd number, you just take the last three people. And instead of grouping off the last two and having one man out as an odd man, you put that last person in with the last group of two and make it a group of three. And as I said, one washes two, two washes three, and then three washes one. And that way, in that group of three, each person has only washed one person's feet, and each person has had his feet washed only once. So one washes two, two washes three, three washes one. We'll be saying that again in case, what did you say? It went right over my head. We'll, we'll illustrate. We'll, we'll repeat that again. But I'm looking now to see if John is with us. Facebook's wanting all kind of permissions. I don't want to give it on this phone. Let's see. See if it'll still let me get in here. Ah, there it is. There's our live stream. And I've got one comment there. I'm hope I want to see if that's uh, okay, Roger. I said say something in the comments. Roger said something. Okay, Roger. Glad to be able to join in. Thank you. You're welcome, Roger. Thank you for joining us. And let's see if I can give you a like for that. Okay, real quickly. Let me go and give you a like for the something, even though now listen, tonight's a solemn night, but it doesn't mean we have to be absolute zombies about everything. But it is solemn. We will want to do, if you've got some people there with you doing the foot washing with you, you do want to do that, as you'll hear Mr. Armstrong say, with, without commenting. I'm just going to write a quick note, if I can, here to John and ask John to... Uh, if, John's still figuring all of this out a little bit, as he said, but John, if you can come back to me and let me know you're here, that'll comfort me to know that John, who's looking to do the Passover memorial service with us tonight, let's see, put his last name on here too. Uh, I want to be sure John's here. Um, others of you that usually join us, I'm not sure if you're joining us for Passover tonight. Um, I'm just going to put a note so you can reply to it, John. Are you uh, are you connected here? Okay. All right. This is a a quick message for John Byron. 
Brethren, while I do this, uh, just a reminder, John will appreciate prayers about the breathing difficulties. Um, I don't think John will mind if I tell you he's 74 years old. So uh, he's got four years on the three score and ten that David gave us, except for reason of strength. So what you might pray for John is that God will give him strength. He's got two grandsons that he's taking care of. I think he didn't anticipate having that responsibility in his older years, but He's taken on that responsibility, and uh, he will appreciate it if God will strengthen him and where he's having the breathing difficulties. God will leave that, give him strength, so he can continue to take care of those grandsons and and do that responsibility like he'd like to do. Okay, now, did that? I see it there, but let's see. How, what do I do to make it? Uh, there we go. It's sent. John Byron, are you connected? here okay John Bryan are you gonna oh I guess I sent it twice all right I'm gonna look for that while we play this um, video I took from uh, the trailer out and back behind me where I have a table set up um, the room in which we lost our electricity during the uh, storm we had a big storm here this afternoon and uh, I wanted to do tonight's service from back there but actually I would have had to haul a bunch of equipment back there too so it's probably better things work so that I'm back here in the studio but I did the setup here I brought the trays that I set up back there I brought them here so that while you're taking the bread tonight I'll be breaking my bread and uh, I may pause and make sure you understand we don't break the bread ahead of time during setup you'll hear us say that in a moment we break that right before that part during that part of the service of the breaking of the bread uh, otherwise you put the whole unbroken uh, piece of unleavened bread whether you cooked it yourself or got it out of a matzo box like I did um, and you <clears throat> you've got it covered with an immaculate white napkin as we're instructed to do you do go ahead and pour your wine a tablespoon of wine and a glass, whether it be the little small uh, shot type glasses like we've often used during services when we have large groups of people, you know, and we carry them in the little round trays and you take out the little shot glass size and it's got a tablespoon of wine in it. Or if you're at home and you don't have those shot glasses but you've got a wine glass, preferably you want to use one of those thin wine glasses because you're only going to put a tablespoon in even though your glass is larger you're still only only going to we only want to use about a tablespoon of wine a, a low alcohol simple red table wine is the ideal not the sweetened wines with 14 15 17 percent alcohol you, you know it you want it simple this is symbolizing the blood of Jesus Christ and you want to keep the wine simple a simple symbol of Christ pouring out his precious blood for us. And uh, you'll keep that covered with an immaculate white napkin until that section of the service. Then you remove the napkin, take the glass, drink the wine, and uh, usually drink it in one sip, even if you keep it in your mouth for a few moments while you're praying to yourself, thinking, boy, the blood of Jesus Christ, and you... You swallow that blood, we take his blood, we take his body, we partake of his body. That's what he wants. He wants us to be one with him and a part of him. And appreciating the sacrifice that he made for us and, um, and being in harmony with him, disciplining ourselves and being in subjection to our father and the, the laws our father uh, established or how to love God and how to love our neighbor and how to be happy both in this life and through all of eternity and with God's blessing for the obedience and learning learning the obedience and the discipline in our lives and making our lives happy and those around us happy because of that. And brethren, for us, those of us who are growing in that and growing and understanding in that and learning to live that way, we found the peace that comes into our lives is wonderful as a result of that. Okay, now let me uh, let me go ahead and cut away. I think I checked with John earlier, and uh, and and we went over what he would need in his room. And I I hope um, I'm going to check my other. I tell you, I'll I'll put this video on and hope it's going to play okay. And I'll check another device 
just in case that one's not receiving uh, comments or feedback from you as well as quickly as it should, I'll, uh, I will, um, let me do that right now real quick. I will go into another source for the comments on another device here. And uh, bear with me a second. I want to make sure John is with us. And again, brethren, your prayers for John will be much appreciated, him taking care of those grandsons. And uh, John, if you're there and able, just give me a uh, give me a word back, if you will, that you're connected in with us, because I'm, I'm kind of delaying to see that. Um, but I'm also delaying just a little bit to make sure that as many people as possible across the time zones in the U.S. can be able to get it in this earlier section, the Passover Memorial, and and we will do another session, but I'd like for it to be as convenient for as many of you as possible at an early time. Okay, I don't see word from John yet, but I've got a message out to him. I've given him a link to this page, and maybe John just not sure how to comment back to me in that section just below where the video is playing. John, if you hit the comment thing, you can tell me, hey, Steve, I'm here, I got it, and um, and I'll appreciate that. Um, all right, I'm going to open this up where I can see it if, it if you come through, because once I start this video, I'll be a little bit distracted with that. And all right, I got that page. Uh, oh, yeah. All right, I got it open on two devices. All right, brethren, this next part of the video will show how to set up your room. We will probably may repeat that again one more time with Robert Collins going through it. But I thought if you could see some video, and this 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 was before sundown, but the sun was going down, and I lost my light while I was out there, and I didn't have the electricity out in that unit, so I'm not sure how this video is going to hold up, but I'm going to monitor it, and we'll see how that goes. And then after this, we'll be starting the service. You can be watching to see if the sun is down where you are after this part. And I'll, I'll remind you of that. I'll ask you to take a look again after this. We're kind of doing pre-Passover in the live stream. Get everybody... Uh, to know, hey, we're here, we're doing this tonight, we're playing the excerpts from Mr. Armstrong through each section of the foot washing, of the breaking of the bread, and of the partaking of the, the wine, drinking drinking the wine, the blood of Jesus Christ in symbol. And uh, <clears throat> so let me roll this, and oh, I forgot to bring the, uh, oh, you know, I've got the closed captioning going. Just a moment. Let me just bring this forward for a second. I got the closed captioning going that's supposed to be appearing on that screen, and the closed captioning device is working. But see, this is one reason why it's good if we can go go get things. Have a little warm up time. Let me just bring this forward for a moment. There's your your bread and your wine. But I'll open that box in a moment. We'll put a flat piece of bread on the plate and cover it. And you don't break that bread until the, we get to that section of the uh, of the uh, service of the memorial service. Um, I'm just going to I just put on a put on something that will enable us to get the closed captions here on screen. Oh, let's see what went wrong. Okay. There we go. Now we've got closed captions for those of you who are hard of hearing. I apologize we didn't get this up early, but I'm just doing a a pre... Uh, let's see, I didn't get that adjusted quite right. Hold on a second, I'm going to slip behind the screen and adjust this a little bit better so that you can see it a little easier, hopefully. Let's see, how's that? Okay, we can bring that down a little bit more, I think. Uh, bear with me a moment. Um, just trying to make sure that okay, everybody can see this in the best way. And those of you watching, uh, doing closed captioning, who ask me to please, uh, please get this on for you. Uh, 
Okay. Okay, see how's that? All right, it's not quite where I wanted it, but... Um, all right, let's cut away to this uh, to this how to prepare, and then after this we will have your room set up. Then we'll start. Hopefully, everybody will be uh, will be tuned in with us, and I'll make any fine final adjustments I need to make uh, while this video is playing. So let's go ahead, and then we'll go to this. Let's see if this is going to to function properly. Well, it didn't. It's not bringing in the bottom section with the closed captions. I'll just have to ask those who are hard of hearing. I hope you can bear with us. We'll, we'll have it up during the actual service. Let me roll this video of how to set up and see see how this how this goes. Okay, for the main part main part of the memorial service tonight, you will need two basic things: your your bottle of wine and your wine glasses. And they can either be glass like these, preferably thin, so that when you put one tablespoon in, it's it doesn't look like there's nothing in there. Or they can be the smaller little cups like these that we are accustomed to giving out during during the service. And in a moment, we'll go ahead and prepare for the evening by putting one tablespoon in there of your wine. And it should be a simple low alcohol red wine, preferably. Uh, just a simple wine to sim be a symbol of Jesus Christ's blood. And then before the wine, for the breaking of the bread, it should be an unleavened bread. Here I was able to find some, some matzos, which are kind of the standard Jewish cracker, unleavened cracker for days of unleavened bread and for the Passover service. And for the part that precedes that, You'll need a wash basin, and we're having trouble having enough light here. You'll need a, a wash basin, simple thing like maybe this, or like we are accustomed to using that used to be given given out for years and years for, in the church would be the old, the old uh, rectangle or square type of uh, foot washing uh, basin and you'll want a clean towel to uh, and if for some reason somebody forgets a towel you can use a little trick we've had to do sometimes when somebody oh I forgot my towel uh, just one of you use one side of the towel and then flip it around and the other person use the other side that's if you know if somebody loving we love one another brother if somebody comes they forgot don't chew them out for that just help them out you know and uh, now you'll want to you want maybe a couple of other buckets that one will have. Um, oh boy, we're low on light. We had a thunderstorm here this afternoon. You will want one bucket that you have your uh, your water in, your warm warmed up, you know, warm water, and you'll need and want a some kind of something to measure out a couple of cups, like I have here, and you just scoop in a couple of cups of water and pour it in your basin. For the first person and then after that first person washes you'll very likely want to have a second cup I mean a second bucket let me move, move this one out of the way and and then I have a, a second bucket that's standing by well, our lights kind of poor sorry about this but um, it, you know, it's just before sundown here, and as I'm showing you how to be sure you got everything you need prepared. But af after the first person's feet are washed, you take the basin where their feet, with the water where they've been washed, and you pour it into your second bucket. And then, bingo, your bucket's now ready to fill from the, from the other bucket, or your basin is ready to be filled from your other bucket that's got the water in it. You take your little two cup pouring device and pour in the water for the second person. Now when there's a, an even number of people it's real easy. You just have one basin for every two people and the two people, one washes one foot and the other feet and the other person washes 
the person who was just washed washes that person's feet who washed them. Now, when you have an odd number, any odd number, doesn't matter, the last three people will do a one, two, three rotation where one washes two, two washes three, and three washes one. That will accomplish getting everybody's feet washed in that odd three-person group, no matter how many even numbers of of two sets you had before that, whether it be four sets of two with eight people and then three more people for a total of 11. Your last three people do a, a one washes two, two washes three, three washes one. So you don't do one washes two, two washes one, and then that third person is kind of like, oops, um, which one are you going to wash my feet and which one of your feet am I going to double wash because both of you already been washed. No, you, one washes two, two washes three, three washes one, and then everybody's been washed. One is washed by three, two is washed by one, and three is washed by two. And one washes two, two washes three, and three washes one. So each person in that odd last odd number of people have each had their feet washed and they've washed one person. They've only had their feet washed once and they've only washed one person once and that works. Just one washes two, two washes three, three washes one. That's for the last three people when there's a total number of people for the evening that equals an odd number. If it equals an even number, no problem. Everybody pairs up in groups of one, two. And one washes two, two washes one. And when that rotation is all done and hopefully you had enough basin so that while one is washing two in each group, every, all number ones washing two are doing it at the same time, and then all two washing ones are doing it at the same time, and then that keeps everything orderly and quick, and we're right back to the rest of the service. Now, while I still have a little light, let's open up uh, what we'll need. First of all, the breaking of the bread is first, and just so you, this is important to know when you... Uh, are preparing for the evening. Now we've we've got I've got some just plain serviette, but not plain. They're premium quality serviettes. Uh, they're paper. You could be using nice linen or cotton cloth. That'd be ideal for you ladies that have that. But for some of you bachelors or bachelorettes out there that are struggling to work and come home and do this and everything, and you you don't maybe have everything a nice a family might have in a nice way, these work fine. As long as they're white and clean, that's, that's wonderful. Um, that'll serve just fine. I'll open those up in a moment because we're going to cover up uh, the bread. We're going to cover up the wine until we start the service. But we're going to prepare this ahead of time. And uh, so for the bread... I've got a brand new box here of uh, unleavened bread, you know, and it doesn't have to be matzos. You can even make your own if you weren't able to find any out there somewhere. Just take some wheat and mix it with water. That's the basic ingredients. Put a little bit of oil in there. No leavening of any kind in it. No yeast, no baking soda, no leavening. And just put it in the uh, uh, a frying pan, saute it um, with a little oil or coconut oil olive oil or coconut oil. Most of the ladies prefer to use olive oil. Uh, you prefer to use coconut oil since we've learned olive oil it tends to do something not good when it gets heated too much. Most, you know, most of them do. Anyway, we're going to open this up and let me take out my knife and find a way to have something maybe hold this camera for me while I do this so I have both hands free. I've got a little device here if you don't mind me jerking the camera around for a moment I'll put this in if it won't stop the recording and are we still going yeah I'm gonna see if I can bear with me a moment so I get a shot of the table let's see I think I can just lower this lower this down maybe that'll do it where's the tilt is there a tilt on this thing okay are we tilted oh we're tilted all the way all right friends amateur hour for just a moment bear with me Get this down a little bit so that. Uh, All right, brother. While I'm while I'm setting up that table in there, I just thought I'd come back with you for a moment. Let you know we're uh, we're kind of just going through a little bit longer time to explain your room setup as I was doing without light and ha and having a thunderstorm. I wasn't able to carry out my tripod and things like I wanted to. Just showing you to put your bread unbroken on a plate. Put your wine one tablespoon in a glass. Uh, small glass, 
It can even be a glass, like we were saying, a wine glass, ideally a thin one. Cover both of those. Cover your unbroken, unleavened bread. Cover your little glass of wine with a tablespoon of just simple red table wine. <clears throat> then have your wash basin and your um, towel. Be sure you got a towel. And if you're somehow short on towels, or one of the brethren that comes over maybe to do wash your feet with you, he forgets to bring a towel, and you only have one, well, fine. One of you just use one side and one use the other. Just We want to love our love our neighbor and help him out. I'm showing you there that we uh, don't break the bread in the preparation. Just have it unbroken on your table on a tray or plate. Cover it with an immaculate white napkin. It can even be a paper napkin, just as long as... Uh, as long as it's clean, ideally white, but cover it. And then during that part of the service, we'll break that bread during that part of the service. And and then the wine is already poured in the glass, so when we get to that part of the wine, we just pray over it. We, uh, You simply take the glass of wine and you drink it. And um, you're drinking in symbol, you're bring, drinking Christ's blood, and symbol with the breaking of the bread, you take a little piece of the bread and you're partaking of Christ's broken body which was broken for our healing so those of you that need healing we're symbolizing what Christ did tonight taking those 39 stripes taking the pain and suffering even of our healing so that we don't even have to suffer the pain if we call on God for that with faith you know as the examples of Christ healing people when he was here on this earth, he often said, and it was lovingly said, he said, according to your belief, let it be done to you. And if the people had the faith, it was often recorded that in that very hour, whatever they were requesting was done for them. There is the example, I believe, is a good one, where the man was asking Christ to heal his son, and when Christ said, well, according to how you, the father, believe, let it be done to your son. Well, the dad didn't take him long to think it through. And like, remember Peter when he walked on the water? He saw Christ walking on the water and said, hey, you know, I'd like to do that. Come on, Christ said to Peter. And Peter steps out of the boat and walks, is actually walking on the water for however long, a minute, a few seconds, whatever it was, until Peter started thinking about it. Wait a minute, this is totally illogical. And down he starts to sink. And Christ said, oh, you have little faith. You have to reach out and pull Peter back up out of the water. <clears throat> All right, I'm just showing you here in this part of my video out from the trailer and back that uh, we put that, sh that unleavened bread, unbroken, full sheet, unbroken, on your tray your dish, your tray, cover it with an immaculate white napkin. Now you're all set for the breaking of the bread part of the service. We will then break the bread when that section of the service begins. And we'll just we'll just break the bread up, you know, just crackle it up so that you wind up with small enough pieces to consume one. And because that's prayed over, that whole piece of bread that you broke is sanctified and set apart as if it were in symbol Christ's body, at the end of that service, you're going to get rid of it where n no human or animal or beast can consume it. So it's recommended you just take it, flush it down to your toilet. Now, that's not sanct uh, sacrilegious or anything like that. It's just getting it somewhere where no human or animal of any kind, any beast, can eat what is in symbol, been sanctified and set apart to be Christ's body in symbol. And so to respect that symbol and that which is prayed over and sanctified in the prayer, after the service, what's, you know, you only eat one piece representing Christ's body, and then after the service, you get rid of that. You, however you best get rid of it, but don't throw it someplace out where animals can just pick on it. Get rid, flush it down the toilet. Some people have burned it. I don't, you know, personally like the idea of burning. It reminds me too much of the lake of fire, so I'll flush it down the toilet instead of that, but... Whatever in conscience you can do to get rid of it, I think would be fine. But if you think about what I said, you might not you might not want to burn it. You might want to flush it down the toilet instead. Or get rid of it in some way where no human or no beast will consume it and, and, and that that symbol is respected, is 
you know, for the purpose of this service tonight. And then after that, well, you know, just get rid of it. And uh, and there, we're, I'm opening up a bottle of wine and pointing out that look, the, the wine is uh, just a simple. I couldn't get a good focus on that, but a simple low alcohol. I mean, low can be nine to twelve percent, something like that. And uh, not grape juice, though. Not you want an actual fermented wine. And we're only taking a tablespoon. So if some of you think, "Well, I've got medical problems," well, you may be listening to too many quack doctors and taking too much stuff. You shouldn't be taking a tablespoon of wine. Should not hurt anybody at all, especially if you're doing it in the Passover and you're doing it before Christ who took those stripes for our healing. He's with you, and if you're with him and you believe in healing, even if you had a problem from the wine for some strange reason, you turn around and say, look, I take, took it during your Passover memorial service in honor of your sacrifice, including the breaking of your body. You're taking those 39 lashing stripes for us by which we are healed. You can claim that healing. If you were to have a problem, which, you know, a tablespoon, I doubt you would. So I'm just covering bases, brother, because we're on a wide-scale basis. We're on worldwide Internet tonight. Made me a little bit uh, nervous at first, you know, like butterflies. But <clears throat> um, some of that, like we're told in speech, if you ever do have butterflies before you speak, it usually just means you're full of care and concern for those you're speaking before and you and you and you want to do a job now i'm holding up a small shot glass size like we've often passed around in services in those big round trays and you'll see a tablespoon just barely covers the bottom of that the uh, wine glasses i'll hold up one in a moment <clears throat> the sun is going down out there so it, i didn't have much light to work from without the electricity and that being off in that unit after the storm uh, there's a shot glass with a tablespoon of wine in it you go ahead and pour that before we start this service tonight. And I am purposely delaying and taking this introduction slow so that as the time zones across the United States get toward sunset, uh, you can have this section, session, as, you can have the service tonight as soon after sunset as possible. Those of you from the east coast to the central time zone, the eastern parts of the central time zone, central time zone, a wide one. As I look through 80 different sunset times this afternoon i said wow even in the same time zone there's as much as an hour's difference between when the sun sets on the east side of the central time zone than when it sets on the west side of the time zone so i'm purposely delaying a little bit showing you how to have your room set up get it now there's a glass some of you may have glasses in at home and not have a shot glass that's fine Go ahead and use your nice glass. We don't do that in big services because if somebody drops one of those and there's 100 people around and there's glass all over a, a commercial auditorium usually has harder, sometimes concrete floor base underneath, things tend to break and shatter more in you know, public auditoriums than they would on your wooden floor or tile floor at home. And with just a few of you at home, well, you sweep it away and... If somebody dropped one, and not a not a problem. So use what you have. Uh, no big deal. Even if you don't have a small glass, if you have to use a big glass, and still you only put a tablespoon in there, just so you can get the tablespoon in your mouth, tablespoon of wine in your mouth, you've accomplished what we need. And if you feel better, kind of like I do, let me reach behind the screen. I'm, I've got a glass back here. I'm going to transfer the wine I have in a small shot glass as I do this part of the service same time with you as Mr. Armstrong's conducting that part tonight. I'm going to pour it in a nice glass simply because I'm honoring Christ with something I have. I have one of these nice glasses here. I'm going to use it. And I'm going to think of Christ's blood as being very precious as I consume that tablespoon full of the wine that represents his poured out blood for us. So there I've got it on a tray. I've got both types of glasses. You can see there the little shot glass. That's how that would basically look. Or if you're going to put it in the larger um, you know, but thin, ideally, uh, glass type of wine glass, thin one. There's about a tablespoon. It just covers a little bit of the bottom. And just take it all in one drink. You don't have to gulp it right away. You can leave it in your mouth for a few moments if you want to be thinking about how precious Christ's blood is that he poured out for us. And uh, <clears throat> But you have that ready. Before we actually start this service tonight, put an immaculate white clean napkin over the top of it 
until we start that part of the service. That will come after the breaking of the bread, which comes after the foot washing portion of the service. So we'll have foot washing, then the breaking of the bread, and then this part, the wine. And you've got two trays on your table covered with a white, immaculate white napkin. You've got a tray covering the bread, unbroken, until we get to that part of the service, and a napkin covering your wine, where the wine's already poured into the glass, and the napkin stays covering that until we get to that part of the service. And then Mr. Armstrong will speak for about 20 minutes and go through some scriptures, primarily from John 13 through John 17, and perhaps some other places of scripture, too. And, uh, yes, yeah, good thing I'm monitoring this with you, because... Uh, I see we had a we have an interruption from uh, some program trying to get me to do something. I hope this doesn't knock out my player. No, it didn't. Okay, I got that off the screen. But I think it stopped. May have stopped our video, or is our video still going? But I think we just lost all the light back there in the trailer. So whatever I'm doing, let me see. We'll, I'll remove everything else. We're only going to do the prayer over the wine in the glasses. So the bottle of wine that you have, you can put it away in your cabinet, like I'm going to do now. I'm going to put this away in a cabinet. And, well, you can't see me doing this, but that's away in a cabinet. And uh, the napkins I'll put away in a cabinet, because we just use the two that are covering the bread and the wine. The basin's ready uh, to go, and you just pull some warm water out of your tap, or if you are in a situation where you need to, put, put some in a pan on the stove, put it in a coffee pot, wherever you need to to clean to, to do that. And, uh, and you're ready to go. Your basin, your towel, your bucket with warm water, your empty bucket to empty out the water each time somebody does the foot washing, and... Uh, let's see, in the bucket to pour that water into, and then your and your measuring cup, your two cup measuring cup, about two cups. Doesn't have to be exactly two cups, but thereabouts, and uh, and you're ready to go. A cup to measure your water into the basin, a towel to dry the person's feet, your feet with, and a plate with unbroken bread on it, covered with an immaculate white napkin. Your bread with. Your glasses of wine poured already out <clears throat> into the glasses, about a tablespoon each, approximately a tablespoon each, and cover it with an immaculate white napkin, and you're ready for the services to begin. All right, brother, and I, as you can see, we lost the light out there in the trailer as I was recording that earlier, but that was the point, and that was a good point, too. For your water for the basin, you want it to be warm. You don't want to shock the person whose feet you're bathing with cold water, ideally warm water, tepid, so you don't scald their feet, not cold so that you don't shock them, warm so that it's comfortable and you're doing a loving service of washing the feet. You only spend half a minute or a minute on each foot, just put some water behind the foot and over the foot, and some people, you know, even do it between the toes and kind of massage between the toes just a little bit, but only about a minute on each foot. And uh, and then you take the towel and dry the person's feet off, and then they put their own socks and shoes back on while you're taking your socks and shoes off and trading places. You sit down, and then the other person gets down on their knees and will wash your feet after changing the water. Now, we usually you use the same basin for two each two people. You can have your own basin if you want to and have the water already poured in each one and ready to go, but... Um, <clears throat> Um, you want the water before services start to be warm enough that by the time we get to the service part, you know, and you can do that just as we're about to start. I can say, okay, get your warm water ready. It's good to have, as I was mentioning there, and I showed you two different buckets, although the light went out, you couldn't see them. One bucket has your warm water in it. The other bucket's empty so that when you, uh, and you have something like a two-cup measuring cup, because about two cups is about the right amount in a small basin to be able to get water over and behind and on top of and through the toes of a person's feet while you're washing them. And so you pour a cup of that in for the first person, then after you wash the feet, you're going to use the same basin, just take that water that you washed the first person's feet with and pour it in the second bucket, the empty bucket, just empty the 
or turn around if you got your kitchen sink right there or wherever you're doing this pour down the sink or but um if you're in a room where you that's not convenient just have a little small bucket there that you can empty that used water into and then take your measuring cup two cup measuring cup take the warm water put it in that wash basin after you've poured out the old water and be ready for the second person and if you got an odd number and you've got a three person group you'll do that one more time get your water from the warm water bucket into the basin pour that out when you're finished washing the feet into the second bucket empty that you know empty or whatever small amount from the person or two before you where you pour out the used water into the second bucket that keeps things decent orderly and running smoothly through the evening and by the way brethren I John greetings and thank you for your message that you're here John's okay so that makes me feel comfortable and we are ready to begin now just a reminder though again to you let me I'm gonna bring the video up to where we have Mr. Armstrong going to be speaking uh, just remember now that when Mr. Armstrong comes on we'll we'll have a five minute pause once I start this that gives you time <clears throat> to uh, there's a one minute thing going to count down to where Robert Collins 50 year minister in Alabama I want to pay him some honor he died in 2011 after starting this live stream on cogtv.org sabbath.tv he was the initial host here and he with Jesus Christ he felt in prayer Christ would want to keep want me to keep this going if something happened to him and he died on the way home from the feast after feast is all over we went to a feast in the Midwest area and on the way home with Ray Green and I swapping driving a minister's wife where we went <clears throat> said she recognized the condition he was in and said be sure he has plenty of Pedialyte on the way home so that maybe you can get back to your state but she said he's not you're not going to get back home alive with him he did not want to go back into a hospital by the way he was ready to go his wife had died six months before that and he had left things uh, pretty well set with me to continue what he was doing and uh, and so but in his honor we're gonna have him just give a real quick synopsis of what I spent some time while I was trying to extend the time that sunset would be down and as we as as we roll through the time zones toward the west from the east I know that makes it late for some of you that may be watching from the east coast but uh, um, you know that's showing love to some of your brethren toward the west coast and again we'll repeat this live session after this finishes just in case sun wasn't down on the far 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 west coast I got I checked 80 different cities in all four time zones wow is there a spread between the sunset time so we're gonna have to do a second session but we can go ahead and start this one I've heard from John Brian Brian uh, John thank you for letting me know you're there greetings welcome we're gonna start rolling this now and uh, I'll only come back just to make sure things are slowed down a little bit and not rushing it too much as we go through this and just show you again what we're gonna do in in that section real briefly and what you need to have ready for that next section. This section is going to just have Robert Collins covering for a few minutes um, what you need to have in front of you. In case you didn't get it clearly from me, he does an outstanding job of just explaining it with numbers on the screen. Here's what you need to have in front of you for this Passover service from in your home tonight or in some small group setting where you might be and tuning in with us. And I'm thankful, glad to have you here with us. We're able to have some means of togetherness and oneness for those that are very scattered via the internet that is another door God has opened and opened since Mr. Armstrong died and opened it with Mr. Armstrong in mind because of so many of his speaking occasions including this Passover service from 1981 the last one Mr. Armstrong conducted from headquarters in Pasadena before he died that he did in 1981 he was overseas the other the other times and um, in 1985, yeah, he was overseas, even for that. So, um, and then got back and got very weak, picked his successor with 
God working that, because God knowing like he knew when Christ was here on the earth, we would need a certain test. Judo, uh, Judas was a certain test and was a required test for somebody had to turn Christ in to the enemy because he looked like an ordinary human being, nothing, nothing in the flesh outstanding in his appearance about him other than he was clean cut and wholesome but so were many other Jewish people at the, of that day and he didn't stand out so somebody a betrayer Judas you know was one who betrayed him all right brother let's go we got John on on tap with us I hope um, the, some some of our other brethren in Texas that usually tune in with us if you were planning to be here tonight I'd love to hear from you too if you're somewhere else I understand if you were able to meet with a few people you know the head of house go can't even conduct this himself. Now, if you're by yourself, it's okay. Let me just point this out. It's okay to not do the foot washing uh, portion of this when you're isolated by yourself. Um, it's kind of nice. It's a it's a humbling thing to do, but some of you have done it for a long time, and especially if you're up there in years. It's It's been said that uh, by Mr. Armstrong himself, if you've got to do this at home and you're home alone don't worry about it if you if you got nobody else to do the foot washing thing with and this should be for baptized members only mr collins is going to say that so let's go to him because i think we we're far enough along in most of the time zones that by the time mr armstrong comes on in about five minutes many of you tuned in right now will see that you look outside you'll see that the sun is down and you're good to go if it's not down in about five minutes when we bring up mr armstrong um, then please just hold off till the next live session. We'll be repeating this a few minutes after we go off with this session. In about an hour from now, we will repeat the live session all over again to cover those on the west coast and west toward Alaska and Hawaii. We're going to do this till very, very late in the night, early in the morning hours to cover the islands way over there in Hawaii. So I'll be here a long time. So if you've had to be patient with me because I'm stretching this to get the sun down in as many places across the United States as I can, thank you for your patience. It was purposefully done to take this slow tonight and not rush it and make this solemn evening as solemn as possible. So let me go now to um, bring in, I've got that, I was able to put that on a button while we were playing uh, from how to set up from the trailer. So let's see. I think I can bring in this screen and at the same time put the put the closed captions. For those of you who wanted the closed captions who are hard of hearing, we can put that at the bottom. I think you can still see the countdown clock pretty well. We're going to count down for just a minute and then Mr. Collins is going to come on and talk for a few minutes and then, then we'll uh, have a no small countdown and Mr. Armstrong will then be coming on. And during that small countdown after Mr. Collins is here, just make sure, please, that, uh, that, uh, just make sure that uh, the sun is down. That's why we've got that little delay in there. And uh, actually, I see that our setting is not quite correct. This gives me, let me pop something up while we're waiting for Mr. Collins to come in, and let me make an adjustment to the screen. Uh, let's see, which one of them need to be adjusted? Adjusted. I think it would be, I hope this is the right one. I'm going to adjust the, uh, not that one, I need to adjust, I think, this one, so that all of those lines come in on the screen. Yeah, there we go. That needs to be about right there. Okay, in 10 seconds, here comes Mr. Collins to repeat how to have the room set up. Here he comes. Good evening, brethren. This service tonight is strictly for brethren, those who are baptized members of the body of Christ, which is the Church of God. And tonight's service represents a solemn memorial for those who are eligible to take the Passover. 
and who have examined themselves in preparation for it. For this Passover memorial, I am going to play for you the audio which added video of the scripture used by Herbert W. Armstrong in the last Passover memorial that he conducted in Pasadena, California before he died. It's the 1981 Passover memorial and we've divided it into sections with pauses in between each so you will have time to do the foot washing in the beginning section before the introduction to the breaking and eating of the bread begins. Then there will be a pause during which you take the bread and then the next section will introduce the drinking of the wine and then there will be a pause while you take it. You take a glass and consume the wine. Following that last pause, the traditional reading from the Bible will begin. During each pause, there will be a countdown clock on your screen so you'll know exactly when Mr. Armstrong will be back to begin the next section. You should have set up the room in which you will observe the Passover before ahead of time. It should be very neat and clean, and you should have a towel and small wash basin and a couple of cups of warm water for each person participating in the foot washing. You should also have a small amount of unleavened bread and very small glasses of wine, one for each person with no more than a tablespoon while of wine in each small glass. Prepared on a tray or table and these should be covered with a immaculate. This service <clears throat> is a very sobering occasion because you are reflecting on the suffering and the death of Jesus Christ. It is also a most encouraging service because it reveals the love of God for His people. We are given this annual reminder of the glorious victory over sin that is ours because of the sacrifice of the only begotten Son of God. There will be prayers within the service over the bread and the wine, but the service which Mr. Armstrong will begin in about five minutes will begin without prayer. Those of you who participate in this service are expressing your faith in Christ's death on your behalf, and you are renewing your commitment to let Christ live His life in you. No unconverted, unbaptized children should participate. There should be no visiting, talking, laughing, joking, or conversation. You are meeting on the most solemn and serious occasion of the entire year. Your approach should be one of great reverence. The remainder of this service will be conducted by Herbert W. Armstrong, whom you will see next in exactly five minutes. All right, brethren, and while we're waiting on uh, Mr. Armstrong to come up in five minutes, I just want to remind you this five minutes is to give you an opportunity to just be sure everybody's seated quietly that's with you, even if it's yourself alone, in a reverent attitude. Maybe open up your Bible, read from John 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, any of those chapters in John. Get yourself into a quiet, reverent state of mind for this most solemn service of the entire year, and to be able to use these few minutes, if you're especially in the Midwest or toward the West, to look outside, be sure the sun has set. If it hasn't set, this is still the 13th of the first month where you are. So it's very important the sun be set so that this service that's about to start in four minutes from now uh, begins where you are 
after the sun has set so that this occurs on the 14th. If it's been an hour, hour and a half since the sun has set, that's still fine as long as we're on the 14th. And you're showing love with your patience for the brethren toward the West Coast that we've delayed the start of this tonight for their benefit to have one calmly done session instead of rushing one hour, one hour, one hour, one hour through each time zone with people rushed and not feeling like it's as solemn a service as it should be. Mr. Armstrong is going to cover a lot of material from John. He will amaze you at how much he can say in a short space. So have your mind set and focused. Nothing else on your mind other than what this Passover is about. Hear what God inspired his end-time apostle to tell us in the last Passover he conducted before he died. All right, you'll have about three minutes now to settle yourself in a very reverent state of mind and to look outside, make sure the sun has set where you are. I'm going to leave us with a few minutes of silence now before Mr. Armstrong comes on to begin this service, except to say this again. It's very important. Make sure where you are, you have a minute if you're in a room without a window, walk down the hall, whatever. Look outside, make sure the sun has set. If not, come back with us. We'll be repeating this service live again in another session after this one finishes in about an hour from now. So I'll lift you two minutes now to go check a window and to get yourself very calmly, quiet, reserved for this most solemn service of the entire year. It'll begin now in, in, a, in about two minutes, as you can see on the clock up here. And so I'm going to pull that full screen, and we'll just wait for Mr. Armstrong to begin in a couple minutes. Be sure your son, the sun where you are, has set. Be sure it's after sunset for tonight's 2018 Passover. Thirty seconds now, a half a minute. God's end time apostle will be beginning this 2018 Passover service. This is the most solemn ceremony or service of the year, my 55th Passover. I'm quite sure that that must be a little larger number than any of you have. God ordained the Passover forever when the children of Israel were in Egypt thousands of years ago now. But at Jesus' last Passover that he observed during his earthly ministry, we read that then came the day of unleavened bread, when the Passover must be killed. Now the day of unleavened bread, actually the day that had arrived at sunset that night, was the preparation day for getting leaven out of the home, preceding the seven days of unleavened bread. It of itself was not one of the days of unleavened bread, but the day on which all leaven should be put out. And he said to Peter and John, Go and prepare us the Passover that we may eat. And 
When the hour was come, he sat down, and the twelve apostles with him, and he said unto them, With desire have I desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I say unto you that I will not any more eat thereof until it be fulfilled in the kingdom of God, indicating that we will continue the Passover in the kingdom of God after the coming of Christ. Now Jesus changed the symbols of the Passover from eating the roast body of a lamb after its blood had been shed and the lamb had been killed to the bread and the wine. So that we read now in Matthew 26, and as they were eating, Jesus took bread and blessed it and broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, take, eat, this is my body. So that the broken bread represented his broken body broken for us. And he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them saying, drink ye all of it. For this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. But I say unto you, I will not drink hereafter or henceforth of the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. And when they had sung a hymn, they went out into the Mount of Olives. Of course, there Jesus talked with them a while. He went apart and prayed. He almost weakened when he realized what was going to happen and that the hour had come and the time of the day had come and he had to face it now. That lasted on through the night. He was taken into various places and tried by the government officials and by the Jewish officials and was condemned to death. Now in John 13, and supper being ended, the devil having now put it into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him, Jesus, knowing that his father had given all things unto his hand, and that he was come from God and went to God, he rises from supper. It had been a supper when they ate roast lamb up to this time. This was the last supper. Now Jesus wants to change it from eating a meal into merely the bread and the wine, which we shall take here tonight. He rises up from supper, laid aside his garments, took a towel, and girded himself. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel wherewith he was girded. Then cometh he to Simon Peter, and Peter saith unto him, Lord, dost thou wash my feet? And Jesus answered and said unto him, What I do thou knowest not now, but thou shalt know hereafter. Peter said unto him, Thou shalt never wash my feet. And Jesus answered him, If I wash thee not, thou hast no part with me. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not, only, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. And Jesus said to him, He that is washed needeth not save to wash his feet, but is clean every whit. And ye are clean, but not all. For he knew who should betray him. Therefore, said he, ye are not all clean. So after he had washed their feet, and had taken his garments, and was set down again, he said unto them, Know ye what I have done to you? You call me Master and Lord. And ye say, Well, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and Master, have washed your feet, ye also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you should do as I have done to you. The washing of their feet was an act of humility. In those days, they wore open sandals, the roads were dusty, they probably didn't have cement sidewalks to walk on. A servant would take off their slippers or their sandals when they came in at the door of a house and would wash their feet, after which they would probably put on other sandals that were there waiting and clean for them. In other words, the host would always have some extra sandals for guests to wear. They still do something like that in Japan. I've gone into homes in Japan where I had to take off my shoes and put on slippers of some kind that were there at the home for guests to use when they came into the house. But it is an act of humility. And he was their Lord and Master, and he stooped to do, do this to them. Verily, verily, I say unto you, the servant is not greater than his Lord, neither he that is sent greater than he that sent him. 
if you know these things, happy are ye if you do them. So now at this time, we will leave and have the foot washing service. And I think you know you all know just where to go. And there should be no conversation, no talking, but quietly go and then return as quickly as possible. Brethren, just a quick word. This is uh, the countdown for the time for people to get the foot washing done, allowing enough time for a group of three, for an odd group number, to get this done. If if you're home alone, just use this time to read through any of the chapters from 13 to 17 of the Gospel of John.
Okay, a three-minute warning will be coming up in a few seconds, and this last three minutes is here for those where you have an odd number of people gathered together, and there's a third person needing to wash person number one's feet. And if the groups of two have all finished, and you should have had enough time to finish by now, if you're not, you got a few minutes to finish up. If you're back at your seat, again, a reminder till Mr. Armstrong comes back on with the next section, which will be the breaking of the bread. You have this time you can be pursuing, reading through any of the chapters of John from chapter 13 through chapter 17. Mr. Armstrong will be back in just a little more than two minutes now. Read now from the 11th chapter of the Apostle Paul's letter to the Corinthians, beginning with verse 23. For I have received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he brake it, and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you, this do for the remission of sins. After the same manner, also, he took the cup when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament of my blood. This do ye as often as you do it in remembrance of me. Therefore, it is a memorial. For as often as ye eat this bread and drink this cup, ye do show the Lord's death till he come. Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup, of the Lord unworthily, referring only to the manner in which you do it, shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. But let every man examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily in the manner in which he does it, eateth and drinketh damnation or judgment unto himself, not discerning the Lord's body. For this cause many are weak and sickly among you, not discerning the Lord's body, that it was broken for us, for our physical healing. His blood was shed for the remission of our spiritual sins. 
His body was broken for the healing of our physical sins or whatever has happened to cause illness, sickness, or suffering. Now from John 6 and verse 53, Then Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Except ye eat of the flesh of the Son of Man, and drink of his blood, you have no life in you. I might just explain in that regard that we do not have life until we receive the Spirit of God. We have a material chemical existence. It is not life in the spiritual sense at all. As you read in 2 Corinthians, the first two chapters, that ye were dead in trespasses and sin. As a matter of fact, Adam and Eve did not have life. They were created with a chemical existence. Before them was the tree of life, and they could have had life, but they made the wrong choice and took to themselves the knowledge of what is right and what is wrong, or of good and evil, of deciding for themselves what is sin. They did not receive life. God has decreed that as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive in a resurrection to judgment. Judgment has begun already at the church of God, but judgment has not begun as yet on the world. Judgment will begin on the world of all of those who survive and are still living after Christ comes when the world is ruled by the kingdom of God and the government of God. Judgment is not a process of condemning, but a trial as to whether you receive life or death. In other words, we might say it is an opportunity to receive life. I think there's been so much misunderstanding on that very vital point. The world is not yet judged. Everyone who has ever been born will be judged in his own due time. But there are three resurrections yet to come mentioned in the Bible. The first resurrection will be those who have been judged to have received life. I hope that includes all who are in this room. That will be at the coming of Christ. The second resurrection will be the resurrection to judgment, the great white throne judgment mentioned in the 20th chapter of Revelation. The third resurrection will occur after that judgment, which may last a hundred years, which may last a very short time. God knows one passage of scripture indicates it could be a hundred years. That scripture can be translated in two different ways, and another way of translating it, it would not refer to a hundred year lifespan in that resurrection. So we just cannot know that. However, the last resurrection will be a resurrection of those who have been judged whose eyes have been opened, who have known the truth, who have rejected God and rejected Christ and Christ's sacrifice for them and God's gift of eternal life, and who have been judged guilty. They will die in the lake of fire, which will burn them up. Not a hell fire that burns and burns and never burns up. Chemically, such a thing would be impossible. Yet millions believed it. The world has been very greatly deceived. Yes, we must have the bread served next. Okay, brethren, let me uh, let me come with you just for a second. Get some of these uh, audio monitoring turned down. Okay, all right. Um, I just want to show you as we begin that part that this is, you'll uncover your uh, tray that's got the napkin on it with the bread and. We hadn't broken it yet. Now's the time to break the bread. So just break it up into bite-sized pieces, and then, and then, during this portion, while the countdown is going, take a bite of the bread. You can hear that. I'm going to put it toward the mic so you can hear me breaking the bread. At this point, we'll have the bread. Please bow your head for the. Okay, and uh, so be sure you got your bread broken, and we'll go back to the video. And here comes a prayer over the bread. Be sure you got it all broken and you'll eat it after the prayer. Prayer. Almighty God in heaven, we pause now to ask you a blessing on this broken bread representing the broken body of Jesus Christ broken for our healing. Father, help us all to take it worthily. Help us to have faith and to believe 
We're in a time of trouble when apparently Satan has come down after the battle with Michael in heaven and is persecuting the church in every way possible. Our only defense is the shield of faith in the armor of God. Father in heaven, help us to understand that we don't work up faith ourselves, that faith is the gift of God, that it comes through your Holy Spirit and that you give it when we are totally surrendered to you. It's not our faith, it is Jesus' faith given to us. The same faith he used to walk on the water, the same faith he used to heal the sick, to perform miracles, to cast out demons. Father, I ask you to give all in this room that faith, a faith that many of us have never had. Open our minds to receive it in the name of Jesus and bless this bread to that purpose as we partake of it in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, brethren, and this uh, countdown is just time for you to be able to take and consume the bread. All right, Mr. Armstrong will be back in about 30 seconds, and the next section will be the, the drinking of the wine. Mr. Armstrong will introduce that and have your tray with the wine ready to go next. Please bow your head as we have the prayer over the wine. Jesus said for all of them to drink of it, that this is the New Testament of his blood shed for the remission of sins. Help us to understand, Father, that this merely is a memorial representing, a symbol representing the blood of Christ. And our taking it means our receiving again the blood of Christ for the remission of our sins. God is the lawgiver, God the Father. Our sins cut us off from God the Father. And when Jesus paid the penalty in our stead, that simply reconciles us to God the Father. And God has eternal life to give. However, the life comes through the resurrection of Christ rather than through his death. And it comes through our resurrection, ultimately, and I hope for God's church, at the second coming of Christ, for judgment is on us now. So Almighty God, bless this wine as we take it, and help us to realize the significance, the meaning of it, that we are once again affirming by taking it that we are accepting the blood of Christ for the remission of our sins and to reconcile us to God. And that means that we have repented, because we have no right, we cannot accept his blood unless we have repented, and to repent means to turn away from sin, that we will not commit those sins, whatever they may be, again. At least that we will strive mightily never to again. And that we ask God's help. He said to the church that if we sin, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins, and not only us, but the rest of the world too. So bless everyone in this room, Father, as they partake of this. Help us to realize 
the real deep significance of it and the meaning of it as we take it. We ask your blessing on it in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, brethren, and this countdown time is so that you can um, remove the napkin from the wine and then drink the symbol of Christ's blood, this wine. And the, the remainder of this countdown time is so that if there's a small group of you, there's time to pass around the tray so everyone gets a, a glass of the wine. And then pick up the glasses and the tray and be ready for the next session section where Mr. Armstrong will be reading from various scripture, primarily in the Gospel of John. The remainder of this time, if you've got your glasses all picked up, you could read ahead just a little bit in John 13, 14, 15, 16, or 17. Well, Mr. Armstrong will be back in just a little bit more than a minute from now with the last part of tonight's Passover Memorial. In the 13th chapter, beginning with verse 31, Therefore, when Judas had gone out, Jesus said, A new commandment I give you, that you love one another, as I have loved you, that you love one another. Most people would not understand how that could be a new commandment. You'll find it quoted way back in the Old Testament. It is new because anything new never becomes old. It is a spiritual commandment and spiritual things never become old. They're continually new. Therefore, it is still a new commandment and always will be. By this shall all men know that you are my disciples, if you have love one to another. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself that where I am, there you may be also. He will come in clouds, he will receive those who have at that time God's Holy Spirit, whether dead or living. The dead shall rise first. We which are alive will be changed instantaneously from mortal to immortal and caught up to meet him in the air. But we are merely going to meet him as he is coming back here. For his feet will rest that same day on the Mount of Olives. And he's going to remain here for the next thousand years. And where he is, that is where we shall be also. Believest thou not that I am in the Father, and the Father in me? The words that I speak unto you, I speak not of myself, but the Father that dwelleth in me, dwelling in him by the Spirit, the same as the Father can dwell in us by his Holy Spirit, he doeth the works. Jesus is the Word of God. He does not speak of just his own will alone. He speaks the will of the Father, but his will and the Father's will are one. They are united. Two cannot walk together except they be agreed. So says God. God the Father and Jesus Christ have been walking together for trillions and centrillions of years because they are totally agreed. 
and always will be. May we be agreed with them. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me, the work that I do shall he do also, and greater works than these shall he do, because I go unto my Father. He said it was expedient for them that he go away. If they did not go to the Father, the Holy Spirit would not come. But if he went to the Father, he would send the Holy Spirit. We could not do such works without the Holy Spirit. That is why it was expedient for us that he go away. He is in heaven, has been alive these 1950 years. And incidentally, it is 1950 years ago to the day that Jesus died. One century of time cycles plus 50. That is rather significant that it happens to be at exactly that time in this day. He did not die at this time of day, but it was the same day. And whatsoever ye shall ask in my name, that will I do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If ye shall ask anything in my name, I will do it. But you can't ask in his name unless if you ask in the power, you might say the power of attorney, of having his authority to do it. And you cannot ask something that is contrary to the will of God and expect that he will perform it. If ye love me, keep my commandments, and I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, meaning the Holy Spirit, that he may abide with you forever. Even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him, but ye know him, for he dwelleth with you and shall be in you. At the time Jesus spoke that, the Holy Spirit was dwelling with them in the person of Jesus, but was not in them yet, not until the day of Pentecost after his resurrection. So he was dwelling with them in the Holy Spirit through Christ, and was later, and on the day of Pentecost, to be within them. I will not leave you comfortless, I will come to you. And Christ does come to the Holy Spirit. Jesus answered and said, If a man love me, he will keep my words, and my Father will love him, and we will come unto him and make our abode with him. Reminds me of something that you will read in the first chapter of First John, that our fellowship is with God the Father and with Christ, as well as with one another. Fellowship is a very, very important thing, and our fellowship is not only with one another, it is also with God the Father and with Jesus Christ his Son. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give unto you, not as the world giveth, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. Now coming to chapter 15. I am the true vine, and my Father is the husbandman. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away, the Father takes away, as the vine dresser. And every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it, that it may bring forth more fruit. In other words, God corrects and chastens, even punishes, every son whom he loves. God's punishment is never revenge. God's punishment is never making us pay the penalty of what we did. God's punishment is always corrective to correct us and to get us back on the track and to help us. God's punishment is always given in love. Many people do not understand what Jesus meant when he said to pray for your enemies. Pray for them that despitefully use you. I pray for all such by praying that God will bless them by dealing with them in the way that he knows is for their good. Now sometimes that might be punishment to correct them that it's never going to be with an intent to just harm or to make them pay the penalty themselves. You cannot pay the penalty of your own transgression. Well, some things you can. It's like on a blackboard or a green board such as we have in college classrooms. You make a mark with chalk and you can erase it. But there are some things, some mistakes you make you can't ever erase. If you should murder or kill a man, you can't bring him back to life. Some sins cannot be corrected. If you steal or take from a man, you can give back, and the Bible tells you how much to give back. 
but overall, it is Christ who paid the penalty of our sins for us. God corrects us that we won't need his shed blood for other sins, but if we sin, we certainly will need it. But he punishes every son he loves. Now he says, you are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. If we are clean in this church, it is through the word of God. If I am your leader, brethren, and you are all my children, directly or indirectly, in the Lord, if there is any reason why God might have called and chosen me, I can only think of one. It is because I have been willing to believe God. The thousands heard Jesus preach for three and a half years when he was on earth. Only 120 were still believing him after his crucifixion. It's a very, very rare thing to believe God. There are many churches, many religious organizations. They all follow a leader. Where did their leaders get what they preach and what they believe and what they teach? I know of none who got it directly from God. They all got it from other men, other people. They come up in a certain denomination. Many of them go to a seminary or a school of that denomination and they just absorb whatever the men of that denomination teach them. I was challenged. I began to study the Bible. I found it said just the opposite of what I'd been taught. I had to begin to prove whether or not I could believe the Bible. I had to prove whether God exists, and I did prove that. And I have proved it to atheists and caused them to admit it. I proved that the Bible is the Word of God. In its original writings, we have translations. There are a few errors or mistakes in the King James translation or any other one translation. We have many translations to compare. We have many, many copies of the original, thousands of copies, and it is possible to know exactly what is the truth. I found I didn't agree with God. I agreed to what I've been taught in Sunday school and coming up in a Protestant denomination. And I found that if I was going to walk with Christ, I had to agree with him. And so I had to change what I believed and begin to believe what he says here. Jesus Christ in person taught the original apostles. Jesus is the word of God in person. I read to you a while ago that he said only what the Father told him to say. Everything he said is precisely what the Father says. He and the Father are of one mind and in total, absolute agreement. The Bible is the same word in writing. The first apostles received their knowledge, their understanding of truth from the personal word of God in person. He's not here in person now. He's in heaven as our high priest, but he's alive and he's the leader of this church. He is the head of this church. But he taught me through this word. I found I was wrong. I was wrong about this and that and the other thing again and again and again. And I had to be corrected and begin to believe what God said by Jesus Christ. That's what I've been trying now for the last 55 years or 54 years to teach you people and thousands of others like you. And it is the truth. And it is truth alone that makes sense, that explains humanity, explains the world and its conditions, explains why things are as they are, explains the evils and the problems and the troubles in the world that the world cannot understand. And the world too often is not willing to understand. Didn't mean to preach a sermon tonight, but I just felt I needed to make a comment or two as I go along on some of these things. Well, again, Jesus said, I am the vine, and you are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him, he bringeth forth much fruit. But without me, you can do nothing. Whatever has been done in this work in these last 54 years has not been done by me at all. It has been done by the living Jesus Christ. I've merely been an instrument that has been used. You may hear a beautiful violin number, but it isn't really the violin, it's the man who plays the violin that's giving you the music. The violin is his instrument, and I have only been an instrument. If ye abide with me, if ye abide in me, and my words abide in you, you shall ask what you will, and it shall be done under you. 
Herein is my Father glorified, that ye bear much fruit, so shall you be my disciples. These things have I spoken unto you, that my joy might remain in you, and that your joy might be full. Ye have not chosen me, but I have chosen you, and ordained you that you should go and bring forth fruit, and that your fruit should remain, that whatsoever ye shall ask of the Father in my name, he may give it you. These things I command you, that you love one another. If the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. If I had not come and spoken unto them, they had not had sin, but now they have no cope for their sin. Coming on to the 16th chapter, just a few little excerpts here. But now I go my way to him that sent me, and now do ask of me, uh, whether goest thou? Nevertheless, I tell you the truth, it is expedient for you that I go away, for if I go not away, the Comforter will not come unto you, that is the Holy Spirit. Jesus Christ has been very busy for these 1950 years in heaven on his Father's throne as our high priest, guiding this church for one thing in our lifetime. He has been guiding it. He built this college campus, the most beautiful in the United States or in the world. Another very beautiful one over in Big Sandy that will soon be restored. And the third very beautiful one that is now owned by a public utilities company and their pride and joy in Brigham Wood in England. And they're all the type that glorifies God, his kind of character, of stability, of beauty, and of the double type of character. Now I'd like to come on to Jesus' final prayer, a little of it. These words spoke Jesus and lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, this is in chapter 17, Father, the hour is come. Glorify thy Son, that thy Son also may glorify thee. I have glorified thee on the earth. I have finished the work that thou gavest me to do. I'd like to make a comment right there. He had finished the work God gave him to do. That is, gave him to do in his person as a human while he was on earth. And that is what he meant on the cross when he said, it is finished, just before his head dropped and he died. What was finished was the work God gave him to do. But he's had other work to do, and that's to guide us in the work that we have to do. And we're only instruments in his hands in doing it. I have glorified thee, he said to his father, on the earth. I have finished the work that thou gavest me to do. And now, O Father, glorify thou with thine own self, with the glory which I had with thee before the world was. Glorify thou me, he said. I didn't get that me in. I have manifested thy name unto the men which thou gavest me out of the world. Thine they were, thou gavest them me, and they have kept thy word. I pray for them. I pray not for the world, but for them which thou hast given me, for they are thine. And now I am no more in the world, but these are in the world, and I come to thee. Holy Father, keep through thine own name those whom thou hast given me, that they may be one as we are one, kept in the name of our Father God. That's why we are the Church of God, not the Church of Armstrong, or of Luther, or of Calvin, or of Wesley that we may be one and united. While I was with them in the world, I kept them in thy name. The name of the church is very important. I kept in thy name those that thou gavest me. I have kept and none of them is lost, but the son of perdition, that the scripture might be fulfilled. And now come I to thee, and these things speak I in the world, that they may have my joy fulfilled in themselves. Neither pray I for these alone, but for them also, which shall believe on me through their word, that they all may be one, as thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee, that they also may be one in us, and that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. I think that that will 
suffice of just some of the things that Jesus said to his disciples on that night before he was taken by an angry mob and taken from one court to another and tried by the Jews and by the courts of Caesar's government until he was put to death and crucified. This church has been persecuted. I've been persecuted ever since I gave myself over to him and I expect to continue to be. I counted the cost. I knew what he said about persecution and it has happened and it will happen. And we all need to be much in prayer. So I'll just give a prayer and then we'll sing a hymn and go out. Almighty God in heaven, I ask you to somehow impress the solemnity of this service and the meaning of some of these things on all of us who are here. I ask you to carry these things in the mind with all of these lovable brethren as they leave and then we will start now to rid our lives of sin. Now we're coming on to seven days of unleavened bread, putting sin out of our lives, as we shall now have put leaven out of our homes and out of our properties. Thank you, Almighty God, for this service. Thank you that you gave it to us and for what it means. Bless all of these people as they leave. I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's turn to page number 22. Rise. Singing together to the I Lift My Soul from Psalm number 25. I'd like you to notice the last bar in the second measure that there is a Pramata hold there. We will hold that note. Page number 22 to conclude the service. brethren thank you for joining us tonight we will be commencing this service again in just about 20 minutes for those on the west coast and the mountain daylight savings time areas then there will be no service tomorrow night no Friday night Bible study remember tomorrow night is the first day of unleavened bread beginning at sunset and the night for the night to be much observed. Until next time, live stream planned for regular Sabbath morning Sabbath service. Well, actually, I'm sorry, annual Sabbath service, the first day of unleavened bread this Sabbath, uh, which will be on a regular weekly Sabbath, the annual Sabbath this time on, that'll be March 31st 
at the normal regular weekly Sabbath times for the first day, the annual Sabbath, the first day of unleavened bread, March 31, here on COGTV.org. Good night, everyone. Thanks for joining us.